if you've joined us uh, over the past couple weeks, uh, we've been marching through what we call the book of Acts, uh, which is kind of what the Holy Spirit was up to in starting the church after Jesus died and rose again. Uh, we get to see the experience and what God's plans are through Jesus and through His church. It seems like a while ago, it's only been two weeks ago, that uh, Rick preached the healing of uh, the crippled man who was in front of the synagogue, the temple. And Peter and John came up and they healed him. Uh, We're a couple weeks away from that sermon and we're still talking about that healing. Uh, We're going to be in chapter 4, if you want to turn there. When people do good deeds... When a crippled man from birth is healed and he's up dancing and singing and walking and people see it and they're listening to the guys who healed him, what could go wrong? I mean, that's just good, right? How many of you think it's good when someone who's really hurting is healed? I love that. I love it. Whether it's kind of miraculous in nature and people are praying or whether it's a doctor visit and you get the good report, that's just a good thing, right? What could go wrong? It's that moment. That moment is what can go wrong. Have you ever had that moment? You know, maybe uh, if you're in your late teens um, and you're a guy, maybe it's the girl that you've liked for a long time that you haven't had the courage to ask out. And finally, you kind of bite the bullet and you're like, I've got to do it. High school's coming to an end. And she says yes. And you're like, ah. I can't believe she said yes. And so you're getting ready for your first date. And uh, you finally go uh, to see the barber. And uh, he does the thing and then he turns you around or puts a mirror in front of you. And you have that moment, you know, like, what did you do? Or maybe you're watching a movie with, with your friends and the movie's going great. Everyone's laughing. It's not a totally appropriate movie. And right at those totally inappropriate moments, your mom walks in to the room, that moment. You know, those moments that, that change direction, that great vacation with your family, you're just traveling, you're, you're loving it all, the car is just perfect, you fill it for gas, you put it in reverse, and you hear uh, the folding of metal. <laughs> that moment that just changes the course of everything. Maybe on a more serious, maybe you've had this moment where maybe one evening you're reading, kids are in bed, maybe the kids are out of the house. You're reading, you're cuddling up with your wife. It's just a good night. You drift into sleep, the fans are on, you're tired, you finally get into sleep and the phone rings. And you have a major, that moment, that changes the course of a whole lot for you. That's what... uh Peter and John are about to have in chapter 4. We all have those moments where something that's going good, all of a sudden on a dime, changes. And something happens. Peter and John are going to have that change of direction, that interruption that's going to stir everything. The healing's wonderful. What kind of moment could come out of it? It's kind, it's compassionate. It's a change of life for this poor guy. They're giving, it can only be good, except that certain people are threatened by it. And they enter the scene. Verse 1, chapter 4 of Acts. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. And if you've been in church for like more than two weeks, you hear that list of people... And you know that story, like you played that tape before, right? When the religious guys show up, is it usually good or is it usually bad? I mean, we all kind of know, like, good, happy things are happening. Guys being healed, people are rejoicing. Man, God is good, Jesus is good. And then you see that list. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of religious law show up. And they change everything. Religious people... We've seen it play out time after time, not just in Jesus' day, but in our day. Religious people bring misery, not joy. I can't think of a time in Jesus' life that he references the religious, powerful people 
to say that, man, that was a really joyful experience when they came. I'm really glad they showed up in the room. They bring misery, not joy, because they love rules, not people. They protect their own power, not those who are down. The religious people are always focused on themselves, never on Jesus. And here's something for us that maybe can change your mind when I say religious people. I don't know who you picture. You may picture me up here preaching. But religious people are not always from a church. Everybody has some sort of religion out there. It may be a religion that I don't have a religion. Well, then you're following something. Maybe it's just good works, and so you have a religion of good works. Or maybe you have a religion of anti-religion. And so you're on a crusade to make sure it gets out of the public sphere. Everybody has some system of belief. Religious people are not always from a church. But when we say religious people, the Sadducees, the temple guard, they always have power. They always have influence. And these are the people who define what is good, what can and can't happen. The reason I say that religious people aren't always from a church, these guys have a jail. We're about to see a jail, all right? I don't know any church in my little circle that has a jail. Truth be told, a lot of the pastors wish we did, but we don't. These guys do. They have a jail. James chapter 1, one of Jesus' guys writes this. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So if there's a religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless, taking care of those who need to be taken care of, loving those who aren't being loved, if that's the religion that God accepts as pure and faultless, it would make sense then at least to flip it and say, perhaps there's a religion that God does not accept as pure and faultless, right? Those that don't really care about people. The people who wield power only so that they can keep power. Those who try to squash anyone who disagrees or has a dissenting view from them. One that doesn't love people and isn't pure. Is there a religion in Washington, D.C.? Is there a religion in our state capital? Those who say we know what is best... We will instruct you, and we will demand compliance with our way of thinking, acting, and believing. Sure sounds to me like a decent description of those around us who aren't from a church, but certainly have a religion. And so Peter and John are caring for a hurting guy, demonstrating Jesus' power, and they're explaining these events to the people. But the powerful aren't in on the deal. Those who just walked into the room, they don't have a hand in their cookie jar. They're not in on the deal, and so they're threatened by the usurpation of power and the attention that people are given. So in verse 2, they're greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. This particular piece of what Peter and John were teaching, the resurrection of the dead, that's opposed diametrically to what the group called the Sadducees believed. They said there was no resurrection of the dead. And here's Peter and John saying, actually there is because we saw this Jesus who you crucified rise from the dead. It leads us to believe there is indeed resurrection from the dead. It's a direct opposition to the Sadducees. And any deviance from the party line catches their attention. And this is a big deviance. Resurrection from the dead is not a little doctrinal point that people who care about these things can have a little theological argument over, all right? It's not like, I would say, the gifts of the Spirit. That's a a more minor theological point. Are the charismatic gifts for today or not? I think there's a place to land, but at the end of the day, not that big a deal for the unity of the church. But when you come to the resurrection of the dead, it's a big deal, not just for the church, but it's a big deal for those who wield power. 
And it always has been. This has been the subversive, rebellious teaching that the church has carried for all these years. That Caesar's not King Jesus is. That the government doesn't have the power, despite what you may think. God does. And we know this because he raised Jesus from the dead, which means that God has the last say, not you. And that's the rebellious spirit that the church has always carried. And when Peter and John are explaining Jesus' resurrection from the dead to the people, it's not just a, a nice third point in the creed that they're teaching the people. It's an altogether uh, world upheaval that the bullies and the tyrants don't have the last word. God does. He's even defeated death. And we see this in Jesus. And He loves you and wants you to be a part of His kingdom that's now already infiltrating this earth. So you can see those who are in charge want to step in. Because if they let this teaching go, everything they have is lost. And that's exactly what they do. There's a big deviance when Peter and John declare that God's kingdom is bursting forth with hope and life and new beginnings, all in the name of Jesus, not in the name of the chief priest, not in the name of the temple guard, not in the name of Caesar, not in the name of the president. And somehow, from everything I've read, from the experiences I've had, I believe Christianity or following Jesus right from its beginning was always meant to be a subversive, rebellious threat to the powers that be. We've just happened to live in a period of history where we haven't experienced it as a church here in America. But if we had someone from the Middle East, or like Esther mentioned, from China, a fellow Christian, a brother, a sister come and give a testimony, guess what? They would tell you that Christianity following Jesus, man, is that a rebellious thing? We're under threat. Every day we wake up, we don't know who's coming in that door. Have you ever wondered why in your history books, when a dictator comes to power, the first target seems to be the church? I don't know of any dictatorship in all of history that has uh, released the church to be the church. Oh, you want more Bibles? Great, we'll give you tax exemption. Go get them, distribute them to the people. That's not how history flows, is it? The dictator comes to power, and the major threat to their power is those who are preaching the resurrection of the dead in Jesus because they bow their knee only to one king, and it's not me. It's Jesus. We've got to do something about these people. And so we hear stories coming from China, certainly from the Middle East. It's not just persecution, but it's the the tearing down of churches. It's the, the taking of the scriptures. It's the putting disciples in jail. Anything they can do to stop the threat that the church has. But you and I just kind of think, well, what threat is the church? And what damage could they do? We like people... I mean, a cripple who's healed, we get excited about that? What's so threatening about it? It's because you and I, a part of a family who has a risen king to whom we give our allegiance and our adoration. Caesar only gets our respect, not our worship. And so Peter and John are hauled in after a night in jail and given this question. By what power or name did you do this? We'll go back, verse 3. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put him in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other men of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? And Peter and John have incredible clarity given to them by the Holy Spirit. Then Peter, verse 8, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple, and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, 
It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. They spend a night in jail. How do you picture that 12 hours, 8 hours, whatever it was? Are they in the jail lamenting? Man, what kind of culture do we live in that they could arrest me when I just did a good name, a good work in the name of Jesus? Were they angry? Man, this isn't how we used to be. Man, if only people, if only people would see the motives of our heart. Were, were they plotting maybe how to save their skin, save their ministry? Were they worried about the implications of the financial contributions to their ministry? Or maybe developing a sound logical argument to be able to put off those who were attacking them. Uh, All of those things is what the church in America, when pressure comes on, tends to do. But don't you picture Peter and John in jail together doing something altogether different? Yeah, I sure do. I think they spent eight hours in the dark, cold cell, on their knees, praying. God, would your name be glorified? Jesus, whatever you have for us tomorrow, would by the Holy Spirit, you give us the ability to speak clearly about your glory and your honor as a resurrected king. I just picture them for hours on their knees until they finally fell asleep, just praying, Jesus, you be glorified. Would you take this opportunity to honor your name? They're filled with the Holy Spirit, verse 8 says. And I think this is God's gift, not just to Peter and John, but I think this is God's gift to His church. That the presence of Jesus would be in us and among us through the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit would enable us, enable you, to do what we cannot do on our own. I read a a question this week that, that made me ponder. The question was, what are you, you individually or you, the church, what are you doing right now that requires the Holy Spirit because you can't do it on your own? And I thought about us, guys. I love you. I have a this pastoral heart for you. And for us. And it threw me back on my heels and I found myself just asking, Oh Lord, are we engaged in anything? Have I engaged us in anything that requires the Holy Spirit to work? Not us. Not our wisdom. Not our finances. Not the people that you've given us, but the presence of the Spirit. Enabling us to do what we cannot do on our own. And then it takes them, when they finally get hauled before the authorities, it takes them about three seconds to get Jesus front and center and for them to take a back seat themselves because this was always going to be about Jesus, not about them. Verse 8, Peter filled with the Holy Spirit says to them, if we're being called into account uh, for an act of kindness to a cripple, then know this in verse 10. You and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. This man stands before you healed. We need thinkers, we need scholars, we need writers, but perhaps what the church of Jesus needs most are men and women filled with the Holy Spirit, ready to clarify the issue for the people around us. Ready to say, this isn't about us. This is about Him. People who are filled with the Holy Spirit, who are courageous to be able to articulate well who Jesus is and what He's done. Because it's got to be all about Jesus. Peter and John tell the leaders that they killed this Jesus. But that God raised Him from the dead and that faith in His name brings salvation. That word... At the end of verse 10, that this man stands before you healed is the same word in the Greek that means saved. Same word. We just translate it different right here. 
because we're talking about the cripple whose body was made whole. But it's the same word. And Peter and John are going to use that word later in a much bigger scene, but they introduce it here. That Jesus has not just brought healing, but He's made the man whole. He's put him right. He's put together again, restored that big word for salvation. That God has brought salvation through Jesus. And they go on to quote from the Old Testament in verse 11. He is, Jesus, the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone or the cornerstone. Peter and John tell these guys that God is doing a new thing through Jesus, that the cornerstone of the new creation that God is bringing about has already been placed, that God is now building on that. The cripple is healed. Maybe in our day it's an addict that's been freed. Or a family that's been saved. Or the hopeless dancing with joy. Or the children made glad. The fearful receiving courage. That God is changing lives. That God is bringing wholeness. That God is bringing salvation to people. And then they lay down the gauntlet. In verse 12. When they tell him salvation, healing, wholeness is found in no one else. For there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. There's no other name. That there's no room for others. That Jesus isn't just one good way to salvation. They say that Jesus is the only way. And I know some of us sitting right here in this church, in these pews today, you believe That there's many ways, as long as you're sincere, that that's what God judges is the heart that's sincere will eventually lead to God. But I just ask you, in humility, would you submit not to your own reason or not to the cultural arguments around or not even to what you want to be true, but would you humbly submit to God's Word where He can't make it any clearer that there's no other name under heaven? by which men can be saved. Buddha doesn't save. Jesus doesn't attack other religions. We don't see him doing that. He just presents the truth. And the truth is, there's only one name to find salvation. And Peter and John clarify it, that that name is Jesus. Not all roads lead to God. All roads lead somewhere, but it's not to him. There's only one road that leads to forgiveness. Only Jesus can carry the weight of our sins. It's only Jesus who was what's called the substitutionary atonement, who could bear the weight of the sin of the whole world on the cross. And that He would die in our place to pay our price. A substitutionary, on our behalf, atonement, payment for the penalty of sins. So that God could be the one who's just, but also justifies. Our culture's changing. Can't you feel it? If we're honest with each other, this 4th of July feels a little bit different than previous 4ths of July. At least for me, it feels different. I feel like I have a decent grasp on culturally what's happening. And one thing that certainly is not happening is the opening of door to freedom or to the freedom of religion. It's not that the door is closed. We're not there. But if you had to force me to say, what direction are we going? It wouldn't take me that long to answer that question. We're going in the other direction. Where freedom of religion, freedom of faith seems to be the first thing on the chopping block because it's being replaced with another message. This idea of uh, Jesus being the way to salvation, the idea of religious freedom itself, is not a message that resounds among the powerful anymore. They have a new message for you. And it's this. In government, we trust Peter and John have this incredible laser-focused clarity that this will be all about Jesus. And there will be a day, I don't know if it will be in my lifetime or, or my kids, there will be a day 
that that phrase, that concept in government we trust will collide head on with no in Jesus we trust. I don't know what that's going to look like. God has not given me any gifts of prophecy, but I know the church must be laser focused on Jesus through this process. In fact, in verse 13, the Pharisees are reacting here. When they saw the courage of Peter and John, they realized that these were unschooled, ordinary men. They were born and raised in Gonic. They had no education up there. They were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. The healed guy's like right there. I mean, wouldn't you expect them to be like, wow, that's awesome. Your God is great. Look, the guy's right here. He's healed. I'm so glad, Peter and John, you came into town. We've been praying for this guy for a long time. And in the name of Jesus, you healed him. That's awesome. Wouldn't that be a fairly reasonable response when the guy who's healed is right there? Wow, Jesus is amazing. Thank you for sharing him with us. Thank you for bringing salvation to this man and correcting our misaligned worship. We've been in need of that correction for a long time. But the fact is, the human heart in darkness likes the darkness. So even though all the evidence is right there, they plot. Verse 15. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin, which is the collection of all these powerful people. And then they conferred together. What are we going to do with these men? They asked. Everybody living in Jerusalem knows they've done an outstanding miracle, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Which just makes you smile like Peter and John are going to be like, oh, good idea, thanks. We're good. No, of course not. But Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was ancient. He was way over the hill. I mean, the guy was over 40 years old. You see, evidence is not enough. What we need, what people need, are new hearts. That regeneration, God's work in our heart, is the only way to faith. The leaders are even giving testimony. There's a 40-year-old man who they healed in Jesus' name. That's called a testimony. They're giving it. But it's not changing their hearts. They don't have a humble or repentant heart. But instead they have one desire, stop it. Stop this thing from spreading. And so here's some truth. Your environment, where you live or go to school or work, your environment does not want your faith to grow. It does not want you to love Jesus more. There are few places outside of the church that I would say encourage you to be more like Jesus. That's not how it goes. I believe that God describes a battle that you and I are in, and it's not with flesh and blood. It's not with people with names. But in Ephesians, Paul writes, but it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And you know where these spiritual powers are going after first? It's our kids. It's our kids. Peter describes these same kind of spiritual powers as lions, like waiting to devour. And who do the lions devour? The weak and the young. 
our enemy is going after our kids. The reason I say that is because the statistics are out there. We're in a battle for the hearts of our children. I've been reading a book called The Evangelical Recession. And in there, they talk about all sorts of groups, Lifeway, Barna, other researchers, say that 65, anywhere between 65% and 80% of millennials, the younger generation, will leave the church from the age of 16 through 23. Gone. 65 to 80% of our kids say, sayonara. This isn't for me. This Jesus thing, it's not working. I don't even know if there is really a God. You're a hypocrite anyway. You know, I don't want to be like you. I don't need this church. And sleeping in Sunday morning sure sounds good. I'm out. 65 to 80%. I don't know how that strikes you. Some of us may say, yeah, but they come back. You know, they have kids. They have no idea what to do with the kids. And they come back. One in three of these About 33% of our kids that leave will come back. So for those of you who say that, if you like a third coming back, great. We don't need to worry. We don't need to pray. We don't need to engage. We get a third of them back. That means over 50% will never see the church again. And we can ask the question legitimately, well, does their heart still belong to Jesus? You don't need to belong to church to belong to Jesus. But I would at least submit There's a pretty strong correlation there. It doesn't need to be one-to-one. But if our kids are leaving the church, it's not a wild guess to say that they're leaving Jesus and they're leaving faith. One youth researcher poses four markers that the kids will remain in church. These are things that he found through interviewing thousands of evangelical kids who have left the church or who have stayed. Four markers that said, these were wicked important. I mean, these were like absolutely life-changing moments for me. Here they are. I wanted the church to help guide my decisions in everyday life. My parents were still married to each other and both attended church. The pastor's sermons were relevant to my life. And the fourth one, at least one adult from church made a significant investment in me, personally and spiritually. Those who stayed with the church point to those things. Essentially, can't you hear him crying out, show me Jesus, get clarified on Jesus. I need to see him in your life. I need you to show him to me in my life. I need the preacher to show how this whole thing works. The kids are screaming, I don't want religion, I need Jesus. The cry is not coming from the outside, it's coming from the inside. Show me Jesus. So FCCB, here it is. Our teenagers, look around, some of them are here, some of them are off gallivanting around for 4th of July. The teenagers need you. Our kids need you. They need me. Summer Thunder needs you, and they need me. We cannot just drift along and think everything is going to be okay with our kids. We have an enemy with a culture, with spiritual forces, looking to pick them off. And so Peter and John finally put out the call. They put out the call. Verse 19, judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight, To obey you rather than God. They say you make the call, but we've got to follow Jesus. And this is the place that you will be brought to, friends. You will be in a position somewhere, someday, where you have to make the call. Where you'll hear Peter's words like, well, you decide for yourself. I can't make that call for you as your pastor. I can only make it for me. You can only make that call for you. But decide for yourself whether it's right to obey you and to be nice in society, not to cause waves and to give up on certain things because they're not correct anymore and really not to emphasize the Jesus kingship thing because and that will make everything just be okay. Decide for yourself whether it's right to obey God 
or to obey man. That day will come for you. And I think part of my job description, biblically, is to help equip and prepare you for that kind of day. To give you the best I can, Jesus and his word. So that when that time comes, that you might be able to decide that I know Jesus is worth it. Whatever cost I might have to pay. Whatever price might be coming my way. Because I want to promise you, because God promises us, when those days come, Jesus is good on his word to carry you through. He's good. Whether it's a prison cell in Jerusalem or a neighborhood in Barrington. I want to encourage us to pray for the persecuted church around the world that they would have the faith to follow Jesus. I can't imagine how hard that is for them. I can't imagine the the scenes that are going through their minds in the last moments or as the threats are being leveled. Would you join me in praying for those who are being persecuted? That they would hold on closely to Jesus and that Jesus would hold them closely. That their faith would be intact. And also to pray for the church in America. And FCCB. That we would have the faith to follow Jesus for the sake of our children and for the glory of His name. His name in which alone is found salvation for all of mankind. Let me uh, invite our worship team up and invite you to pray. God, I pray this morning for our church, for our sister churches in town and around this area. Lord, when conflict arises, which it will, that we might have incredible, passionate, authentic clarity on Jesus. And that we would respond to the the call for decision-making with great courage. Oh God, I pray that you would draw us close to your heart. That we would see you for the God you are. You're gracious. You're slow to anger. You're abounding in love. Your loving kindness is as high as the mountains. Your faithfulness is as deep as the seas. Oh God, would you open our eyes to just catch a glimpse of your glory to carry us through. And may we be found, like we sang earlier, waiting well for you. Lord, I pray for those right here this morning who are in scenarios within their families, maybe at their workplace or in their friendships where things are getting tough. And God, may you grant them great faith by your Holy Spirit to be your men, to be your women in that place, and to even be loving enough to point to salvation in Christ. God, I thank you that you hold the whole world in your hand. And we're thankful that we have a sovereign king whose name is above all other names. And it's in his name we come before you. Amen.